my name is Dipen Parekh. I'm the professor and chair of the Department of Urology at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine, the director of robotic surgery, Victor Politano Endowed Chair. And I'm also privileged to be the chief operating officer of the entire University of Miami Health System. You are listening to the interview with the surgeon at the Surgeon Agent. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining Interview with the Surgeon. Today, we welcome Dr. Depen Park, Chair of Urology at University of Miami. Doc, how are we doing today? Doing great. Thank you, Matt. Thank you for being with us. So, you know, getting started, what were your goals and aspirations during your residency, and how did that change throughout your fellowship? So, you know, I did my residency multiple times. So I did, I'm a fully board certified general surgeon and a urologist in India. And uh, then I came here and repeated my residency again in urology uh, here. And so the reason for doing all this was not because I was seduced by a better life in the United States. When I was going through my residency in India, I just always wanted to be the very best uh, urologist uh, that I could become. And when I, re and I realized that when I was undergoing my training, that what I read in the books and what I was actually doing in practice were two very radically different things. And I asked myself, you know, it will be a shame to not go to that part of the, of the world where you actually practice what you, what you write in the books. And that I got the Rotary International Scholarship that allowed me the freedom to, to go wherever I wanted to go. And I chose the United States, came here, and then obviously I was so blown away with the quality, the type of training and the work that went on here that I actually decided to do a full residency again. When I was doing my residency again here in the United States, I already knew I wanted to be a urologic oncology surgeon. So, uh, but I wanted to be the best version of uh, a urology resident first, so that I'm well versed with all areas of urology. And uh, the key was to, to to do, to basically do enough to get into a great fellowship. Uh, also, remember, I came with a young family at the time, uh, you know, in a different foreign country, and I knew that I was already going. I already, I'd already gone, gone through the entire training back in India, and I was putting seven, eight more years to my time. So I had to pace myself. I could not be, uh, you know, I could not make myself a very enthusiastic resident waking up four o'clock in the morning. To, to do mundane stuff, but I never shirked that. I welcomed that. At the same time, I knew exactly what my goal was, and that was to be a urologic oncologist and then take it from there. So as you're going through that last fellowship year, what was your mentality into the job search for the first time, and how that perspective changed in the beginning years of your career? So before you even go there, I think, I think residency is very, very important, but I think fellowship is the key. Because if you do a fellowship, then you now differentiated yourself into a very, very small group of people who only do that particular subspecialty for a living. So that's a very serious thing that you're doing. So imagine the five years of training that you do, then you narrow it down to one or two years of fellowship and you end up doing only that thing for the rest of your life. It's a small group. You want to be an important part, a critical part of that group. So I think doing a fellowship at a place like Memorial Sloan Gatoring Cancer Center up in New York gave me the credentials and the training to call myself a urologic oncologist. And then I decided that I wanted to be into academic medicine and I wanted to climb the academic ladder. And the most important thing that I chose uh, in terms of my first job were two things. Number one is mentorship. I found the best mentor in the world uh, for my job. And number two, the job should be needing you. There are lots of programs I find, I hear this so many times, for young trainees that, oh, I, you know, I have a geographic limitation. I can't leave New York. I can't leave Miami. I can't do this. I can't do that. Well, then your career trajectory is going to be significantly different than someone who can do that. Because if you are in a saturated program where there are already seven people doing the same thing that you are doing and you are starting, how are you going to differentiate yourself? But if you go to a place which may not be uh, as big of a name or big of a city, but very importantly, that place needs you, which means that there's no one else in that place that actually does what you do. They are hungry to have someone like you be a part of that program, and there's no dearth of clinical volume. And so once that happens, then you really jumpstart and accelerate your trajectory in your career very soon because you grow very quickly, 
you have the critical mass of patients that need to be uh, served by you you are hungry to do that anyways and then you find that match and then that has several positive domino effects in your career so i think the two things that i would recommend for everyone is number one go to a place that really needs you which means you your services are valued they are not in they're in short supply and you'll be very busy very soon and number two seek out the best mentorship uh and i i got i was just very privileged to get both of them now things may differ if you are a basic scientist or you're a translational scientist or you're an outcomes researcher or you are generally research heavy in an academic setting uh then obviously you don't want to do too much of clinical work but you want to go to a place where you have that capability available uh you know whether it's a wet lab or a, a outcomes research group or great uh statisticians or great artificial intelligence groups and so on and so forth that you can actually take off on your career. Can you briefly take us through your career and your journey of how you end up being the chair at University of Miami? Sure. So, um, you know, I like I said I I did my training a couple of times in India and here. I started uh at at University of Texas in San Antonio under a superb mentor and because of my previous training I did negotiate uh that he should recruit me directly as an associate professor rather than an assistant professor because of the training i was very productive in my residency and fellowship i had the publications and all those things and he understood and uh, he supported me so that really literally shaved off four or five years of my career uh, in, in in some way uh i uh, went to san antonio when they i was the first robotic surgeon in the university of san antonio texas at san antonio So obviously I got referred all the robotic surgery cases to me. I took on a lot of risks. So at a very early stage I actually made myself available to do satellite uh, outreach type of surgeries where I went to the border of Texas and Mexico uh, in South Texas at Doctors Hospital in Renaissance and started a robotic surgery program. And again I did all these things because I just wanted to be busy. I just wanted to be the best robotic surgeon urologic oncologist in the world. and i needed a volume for that so i was just seeking volume i was doing my best for all these patients at the same time i had just a phenomenal mentor ian thompson who, who was the chair of urology at the time who took me under his wings uh, he has, he probably has more new england journal papers in urology than anyone else in the country and just just the kindest nicest person you can ever see and meet in your life and so he uh, took me under his wings for the research part and he told me something very profound he told me the pen you are just two things away from being a leader in a chair either a extra murally funded grant a research grant uh, or uh, a a publication in a very high impact journal like a lancet or new england journal or jama or something and if you do one of these two things or both ideally you'd be in the top 0.01 percentile of your peers in academic medicine and that selects itself to become a chair or a leader and i took his words very seriously so while i was busy building up clinical practice uh because of my efforts guess what happened the doctors hospital at renaissance in south texas they were so happy with my work that they gave a 2 million dollar endowed chair within 2 years of my fellowship of my job and i used the money from that and dr thompson supported me to do uh and because i don't have, i don't do translational science i do So for me I'm a clinical surgeon and the lab the operating room is my lab and the and the patients are my patients and so I did all clinical research and so I was able to do some very significant work in kidney cancer research in renal ischemia while doing partial nephrectomy for kidney cancer and I started uh, randomizing patients for open versus robotic cystectomy that gave me the preliminary data and once I got the preliminary data I submitted for an R01 grant with the National Cancer Institute and I got the R01 grant to do a phase 3 national trial comparing open to robotic surgery the first trial of its kind in the whole world and so just doing simple things serendipitously led me or gave me the money and the resources to do other things and then so at the end of 6 years I I got an endowed chair I jump started on on major clinical research I got an R01 grant uh 
I became the division chief of urologic oncology because I was clinically extremely busy. I was the director of robotic surgery. So I started that whole program. I was the fellowship director. And in addition to all these things, I was kind of ready after five years, or three or four years for a leader, major leadership role. But I was young by, by the standards in, the, in this country. I was still about 40 years old. And I knew that, that many people would think that, oh, he's so young. You know, I don't think that he's still ready for being a chair. Obviously, I can't change my age. And I realized that at tick mark, I checked, I put a checkbox on every single thing that you look for in a chair, but I'm young. So what I tried to do was why I said, you know what, I'm going to overcome that barrier by, by getting a degree. So I did a master's degree in healthcare administration from Trinity in San Antonio, which is one of the top most programs in that space. So I did an executive uh, master's in healthcare administration so that I could know, learn the administrative aspects of things. So all these things were happening. There was a national search in Miami for their chairmanship program. There were 32 people uh, who applied for the job. I was one of the 32. And then they narrowed it down to five and three, and then I was a finalist and I got the job. But it didn't stop there. Even after I was a chair here in Miami that I am for the last nine years, four years back, you know, once you, once you establish yourself, once you are good at something, and once you add value, ultimately it's all about adding value. Always remember that your leaders, the CEOs, the, the deans, the university presidents, they are all capital allocators and they are going to allocate capital and resources to the winners, not the losers. So if you don't complain and if you focus on what you have rather than what you don't have and work the best with what you have, do more with less and show results without being a pain in the neck uh, in a nice way, people are going to allocate resources and capital to you. So four years back, completely unsolicited, I was offered to be the chief clinical officer for our entire health system. And I took that with all, uh, all my vigor and passion. I still continued to do my surgeries and being a chair of urology. And then last year, I became the chief operating officer for our entire health system. Ours is a $3.2 billion health system. And I was just privileged to take part in that. I was made the commander in chief of our COVID response. And so now I'm the chief operating officer of the health system along with the chair of urology. I still do my clinical work and my surgeries. It's possible to do all these things, but I, I never ever, it was never my goal to be the chair of urology. It was never my goal to be the CEO or the chief clinical officer of the health system. All those things happened because I was just doing one thing at a time and I was trying to do the best at that particular job. And then each thing led to the others and like I said, talent is very limited. There are a lot of great people in medicine, but there are not a lot of people who strive to do their best every single day and who keep their eyes and ears open and who basically will be who say yes to many opportunities. Um, obviously, it's critical to have a supportive family to allow you to do any all of these things. But uh, these things just happen once you focus on being excellent in one particular thing. In my case, I just always become, wanted to become the best robotic urologic oncologist or urologic oncologist in the world. And still every single day, I try to do that. That's my DNA, that's my calling. Everything else follows after that. So as leader of the program, what advice do you have to residents and fellows entering the professional job market for the first time? That short-term success is the enemy of long-term greatness. A lot of people focus on all the short-termisms. You know, it just boggles my mind when I see recruits who talk about, oh, I want this in writing, I want that in writing, I want this resource, I want that resource. Obviously you want the basic resources that you need, uh, but people get too fixated in short-term successes. Uh, you just want enough that will allow you to do your job and then you can't have all at once. No one has all at once. No one has a perfect setup or a perfect job. But whatever you have, you've got to demonstrate that you are the person to make it happen. Uh, and then uh, once you do that, find a mentor who will make you dream about loftier uh, goals rather than short-term goals. The common thing in academic medicine I've seen is a lot of people, I call them commit committee urologists or podium urologists, they love being a part of, uh, uh, you know, they, they like being on the stage to 
moderate session to do this and that. I always tell them, try to be the person who's invited on the stage to share their research, to share their work, rather than moderating someone's work. Uh, but there's a lot of these false notion uh, in academic medicine that somehow if you sweet talk and if you, you know, uh, suck up to important people, then you'll be, you'll have more visibility or you'll have more presence uh, and that you'll be, you know, known. You know what the easiest way to be known in the world is to do your best work. Let people will know you based on your work and your talent. You don't have to do any of these other things. Uh, so rather than spending and wasting time on all these things, in fact, to me, it's a drag. It's a distraction on your time. Have that much time that you can focus on your family, on your hobbies. They'll be much more worthwhile uh, in order to keep you fresh for doing your main core body of work, whether it is surgery, whether it is research, whether it is collaborating, rather than doing all these other distractions that actually come in your way of long-term greatness. People also get fixated in terms of salaries. I would rather go to a place that is offering me a little bit of less money, but as more opportunities, rather than go to a place that gives me $50,000 more or $100,000 more, where I'm going to be kind of limited in my growth and stuff like that. But I see so many people fixated on these small short-term things that come in the way of long-term greatness. And then last but not the least, when you're doing your research, think about a paper that is going to be published in the Lancet or New England Journal or JAMA, or think about some impactful work. It may not be impactful for the rest of the world, but in your mind, it has to be impactful. It can't be, you know, a lot of focus on quantity or quality in terms of research. People have bragging rights, I have 100 papers, 50 papers, 200 papers. It doesn't matter. Have one, but have one that you go, you're going to be proud of. So sometimes, and, and this is a, a self-fulfilling negative cycle because you do some some of these type of research, research which is not that impactful, uh, but it's the flavor of the day or whatever, that gets you on a podium and then reinforces you that what you're doing is actually great. Otherwise, you'd not be invited to some of these meetings. And then you become a victim of that and you never come out of that. Instead, do something meaningful. It may take you, the trial that I did, it took me eight years to do that study, but it went into the Lancet. It, it was something that I'm proud of. It's something that uh, uh, you know, it, it will be a, a significant body of work. Same thing, I did a study on renal ischemia. It took me three or four years to do the study. I could have had 50 papers uh, doing retrospective type of research in that time frame, but I did not fall prey to those things. And that has been my, uh, my firm uh, belief that again, short-term successes in terms of seeing your names uh, in, 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 a, uh, in, in publications that may not be as impactful can come in way of you thinking about bigger, better studies continue to do all my roles uh, as a surgeon, as a clinician, as a chair of the department, uh, as a chief operating officer. And I just want to say one thing, if you aspire to be in a leadership role, it's all about people. This is not about you at all. Uh, right now, I have many ideas in my head about urology. I just don't have the, the, uh, the time to do it myself. But guess what? I have such a wonderful team of people that I can, uh, uh, you know, collaborate with or give my ideas to them and watch them Take it to a new level. That's your success. If you're in a, if you aspire to be in a leadership role, that's the other flaw I see in a lot of academic people. They're so bright, but they're so insecure. If you just let go and surround yourself with people who are better than you are, smarter than you are, and the more the more you give, the more you get. So if you have any aspirations to be a leader in any role, and if you want to do too many things, just surround yourself with the best team and get out of their way. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Interview with the Surgeon. Until next time, stay focused and keep following your dreams.